We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for your patience today. As you can imagine, lots of things to line up as we present um, a, a different way to do webinars. Uh, Jan and I normally do our webinars together. Dr. Carney and I normally do them sitting together. So we are practicing what has been um, directed by the CDC and University of Vermont is practicing social distancing. So we are indeed um, doing webinars in a different way today. Um, so thank you everyone for your patience as we got ready. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us as we continue to learn about the emerging and rapidly evolving situation surrounding COVID-19 and the coronavirus. My name is Nicole Lewillier Fenton. I work with the Continuing and Distance Education at the University of Vermont. Um, we, of course, at the University of Vermont are following all of the updates about COVID-19 with concern for everyone affected, and our hearts go out to all of the people who have been impacted. We are absolutely in a challenging time. We're all reinventing how we're doing things a little bit, including webinars today, and I'm sure many of you are uh, adjusting to working remote and remote learning and a new way of doing things, um, even though uh, we hope this is certainly very temporary. So Dr. Jan Carney is with us today, and we're so thankful that she is here. She's an expert in public health, a former commissioner of health for the state of Vermont. Dr. Carney, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. You're welcome. So I'm gonna get right into um, the presentation, but just a, a few little housekeeping notes for you all. Um, you've seen the chat box already. Thank you very much for letting us know when you were hearing, Jan, and, and a variety of different things. I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat box. We also have a team of folks helping us um, to answer your questions. We have Dr. Victoria Hart, who is also on the public health team, who's answering questions. And we also have Kelly Baldwin, who's also joining us, helping to answer and put in links um, to different studies and different things that we may be uh, talking about throughout the presentation. And also, um, there are live links in this presentation. So as you're seeing this through Adobe Connect, you can click on something in the presentation and go to um, what we've linked. Um, and we will record this and we will share this out and it will be on UVM's COVID-19 information page. Um, so again, we'll do our best to keep an eye on all of your questions today. So really what we're talking about today, um, there's so much information as we all know and it's uh, a little hard to step back from it sometimes as it seems to change by the minute. Um, but really what Dr. Carney wanted to talk about today is the science of social distancing. And, and Dr. Carney is an absolute expert on the topic of public health as being the former commissioner of health for the state of Vermont. She is our associate dean for public health and health policy and the senior advisor to the dean and runs the public health programs, our master of public health program, which is an online program out of the Larner College of Medicine. Um, so let's talk about, Jan has put together a pretty robust agenda for us today, um, status of what is happening uh, across the United States and in Vermont as well, and really the questions that I think we're all grappling with and trying to understand, how do I keep myself safe? How do I make these changes to hopefully keep my family safe, people around me, and my community as well? And, and what is social distancing? We've heard a lot about it. There's been a lot of explanation. Jan will walk us through the science of that and um, the data backing up why we are doing this and why we are being asked to do this as a community. Flattening the curve, I think many of us have seen this information. Dr. Carney will go into more detail. And then one of the things that I think is in incredibly important is where should we be getting our information? Um, there's so many different things that are happening information-wise. Um, it's hard to know what you should be listening to, and Dr. Carney will advise what are the, really the sources that she recommends that you pay attention to. So Dr. Carney, I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay, thanks. This is a source I'm going to come back to over and over again. It's the CDC. They have a full website. Here at UVM, we have our, a website, and it links you also to the CDC and uses the highest quality information. So again, I recommend CDC, our own health department, uh, first and foremost, the World Health Organization, and I'll give you a couple others that I think have a lot of really high quality information. This is the global situation, and this is from Johns Hopkins University, and they report this live map. And when you look at it, you decide how often you want to look at it because it's a little scary, and it does reflect the global spread of COVID-19. Um, as you can see, the numbers have increased and continue to increase. Uh, this is one source that we also have on the UVM website and for your information. Great, thank you for that. And it's changed quite a bit since we did our webinar a few weeks ago as well, as had 
the information here in the United States. So this is so this is from the CDC, and they update this. I think they do this at, at about noon every day. So you can go on their website, and they have a map of the United States, and and you can see kind of which states have been most heavily affected. It's also Im influenced by the availability of testing that may vary, and it's varied in the United States, and other countries have done a little bit more testing. People are working all across the United States, the CDC, individual state health departments, often with ho hospital labs, also to try and increase the availability of testing for people who are ill. And here you can see the map, New York and, and Washington State and California have been severely impacted. We do have some cases here in Vermont. Um, this is not surprising based on the pattern that we've seen coming across from China and Europe and, and now in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is the health department website. Also for those of us here, I, I strongly recommend that you go to their website. They also link back to CDC for some of the national data. You can see they have 19 positive tests. This is changing every day. They've conducted a lot more tests um, that are negative. And then they're, they're monitoring people. People who have an exposure to somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or have returned from travel in the past two weeks. And so the health department has complete guidance on what you, what you should do. And they update their website uh, all the time. Great, thank you for that. I think it's uh, helpful for folks to know where where you're looking, you know, what, what sites that you're going to, Dr. Carney, to, to find out the latest information. So that's helpful. Um, and I think we've heard a lot of information as to how we're modeling some of the behavior and the social distancing because there's evidence that this has an impact. So why don't you walk us through um, the information that what we've learned from previous pandemics? First, this is, a, this is you hear it called novel coronavirus or and COVID-19 a novel virus, one we've not seen before. And that means that our population has no immunity to it. So that that's new. And we don't understand some of the elements of exactly uh, how contagious people are and what the, what the future spread will be and for how long. But what we do know in terms of public health protections is much of what we've learned from past and much older pandemics. So this is, they are called them non-pharmaceutical interventions. Let me explain these terms that you might hear and then I won't use them again. Non-pharmaceutical interventions means any interventions that do not use medications or vaccines, period. And that's a complicated way to say that. But this was a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association I thought was a really good one. And it talked about those interventions uh, performed in United States cities during the 1918-19 influenza pandemic. So I want to go through a few findings from that. All right, let me tell you what the researchers did. And the reference to the study will be there. And you can read the whole thing. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, they looked at community mitigation. OK, community mitigation is another term we're going to see. And again, this is population-based prevention. And I'm going to show you some specific examples on that. Uh, in 43 cities uh, during 1918 and 19, and their question was, was this variation between cities in the number of deaths or the, the ultimate uh, bad impact related to the, the pandemic, related to the timing and the duration and the use of these different approaches? And they looked at three major categories, closing schools, canceling public events, and isolation and quarantine of people who were ill. They went back and they did some epidemiological and statistical analyses of historical information. They used census data to look at mortality, and they found a total of more than 115,000 deaths, excess deaths. That means deaths over what you might normally expect in a given year in those 43 cities, which reflected about a little more than 20% of the entire US population. So I'm just going to show you one chart to show you sort of what was the most common thing that was done, because this is really important when we look at the results. Some of the things that they did, and you can look at the percentage of cities that did these for more than a week, for a week or more, and school closure and bans on public gatherings 
were the most common in about 80% of the cities. And they did them for, you know, on average about four weeks, but anywhere between one and 10 weeks. And let's see what the results of those uh, were. Okay, the school closures and bans on public gatherings, there was a significant reduction in deaths from the pandemic. And doing this earlier, so when, when cities did this as soon as they possibly could, it led to an overall total number, reduced number of deaths, and, and that peak was lower, meaning, meaning the absolute number of people who were impacted, made ill, and severely ill, and died. And then the longer they did that, and, and this is, remember, this is more than 100 years ago. So it's, it's not the specific length of time, but the principle here is that the longer they did it, if they did it for, you know, uh, on the average four weeks, but there was a, a difference between one to 10 weeks, the longer they did that, the fewer people died. So this is really important when you think about the kinds of things we're doing right here in Vermont. We're closing schools. We're closing bars and restaurants. So people can still get takeout meals, but we're not having people congregate together. Uh, we are limiting visitor access in hospitals. We are severely restricting access in places that are nursing homes, long-term care facilities, assisted living, where we might have older people who we know with COVID-19 are more vulnerable. And, and one of the things too, that it's obviously helping to alleviate some of the stress on our healthcare workers. Um, so, so can you talk about that a little bit as to social distancing is thinking of the greater good, but there's a whole other population of folks here that, that we haven't mentioned yet today, and that's our healthcare workers and the stress that this type of situation puts on them and how social distancing can help them as well. Yeah, we're trying. what you're trying to do really is through these different examples, and I'm gonna give you some more examples, is you're trying to reduce the amount of infection spread in the community through all of us. And that reduces the number of people who need to get health care, whether that's doctor visits or nurse practitioner visits or hospitalization. And that reduces the overall stress on the health care system. So that is one of the important goals here. And I'm going to show you a graph that kind of illustrates that also. So this community mitigation, I mentioned that, and it's actions that persons, individuals, and communities can take. So we're looking at individuals and population, and that's the public health part, and it's just to help slow the spread of respiratory viruses. So these NPIs, and again, we're gonna start calling about these as social distancing and flattening the curve in just a minute, but there's three general categories, personal, community, and environmental. And I want you to think about that because People think just about a virus, and this is a new virus, and we know we don't have immunity to it. So we think about the only thing that's important is the property of that virus infection itself. Well, that's part of it, but also part of what happens in our environment and our own behaviors, both as individuals and a community, have a huge impact on the spread of that virus in a population. So as individuals, if we are sick, we should be at home. And we should not be at work, we should not be out, we should not be at the grocery store, we should be at home. If we're coughing and sneezing, we should cover them. These are the kinds of things that we tell people every year to do about the flu. We should be washing our hands often. And that we also, if we can't wash our hands for some reason, we should be using hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Right. So in our community, the big thing here is creating space between people, people at work, social distancing. So when we're at work, people now we see who can work from home are working from home. That's great. What that does is that protects that person and also there's fewer people in the work environment. So those people aren't close to each other. So that's social distancing at work. We're temporarily closing schools, postponing large events. The principle here is crowds. You, we don't go out where there's a lot of people. And as individuals, as I'm gonna say over and over again, try and stay six feet away from people. Environmental, what does that mean? Surfaces that are frequently touched. The big one for everybody is cell phones, right? 
and we look at our, our uh, keyboard, our mouse on our computer, um, the door handle to wherever we are, those kinds of things. And you, you can think about those. Keep them clean. And, and that's, an, that's an important uh, environmental uh, thing. The, the National Institutes of Health, and there's been on the, the national news some information about how long does this virus really last? Mm -hmm. And it may vary from, depending on the surface, it could be from hours to even a few days. Um, and so, but, but that's, you should focus on how you don't have to worry about whether it lasts three hours or 12 hours because you're cleaning that surface on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are really great tips that we had heard also from Dr. Gleason and from you, Jan, as well, when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And so many of those things are still the same. I'd be curious to see, too, I've seen a lot of folks be thinking of, you know, can I go into that store to go get milk? Is that how extreme should we be understanding the distancing and the social distancing? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean... And we have to just step back and, and I, I want to get to, you know, we hear all these different things and what we believe, are, and there's a lot of rumors out there, but let's have you some common sense. So if your previous habit was to go to the grocery store every day, you might want to stop and say, hmm, maybe I'll just go once a week. And we don't all have to go at the same time. You know, Saturday between noon and 3 p.m. might be very, very crowded. So think about there might be different times. Some of the grocery stores are actually changing their hours, mm -hmm. but because people have been um, buying quite a lot of things, so they don't have to go so often. But but just again, some common sense about some of these things. Great, thank you. That that helps um, to feel a little bit more reassured to hear you say that as well. And I hope that does for many of our folks at home too. Um, you've touched on these different things, and I know we're seeing a few questions come in. Um, through the chat box as well, really clarifying um, what we what you mean by sick um, and what level, um, you know, fever and, and and some of the symptoms related to um, coronavirus and and where people um, what advice that that really the physicians and the CDC is giving to folks if they're concerned about their health. The symptom the symptoms that we're talking about here are the most common symptoms, but they're not necessarily the only symptoms or the symptoms that everyone has but a fever and a cough. Sometimes people get short of breath, but fever and cough, it's flu kind of flu symptoms. You know, and some people who I say, oh, well, you just have a, a fever and a runny nose that you can come to work, right? I'd say wrong. You know, error on the side of, um, is it a bad cold or is it getting worse? Stay home, stay home if you're sick. And then th we say that that is the one time if you have a mask that you can wear it. And you would have to be mindful of the people who are in your household. So maybe you stay in your room and somebody brings food to you, as an example. But really kind of isolate yourself. Stay home if you're sick. Err on the side of doing that. And then in terms of, oh, my goodness, maybe I need a coronavirus test. I should drive to the ER, right? Wrong. No, don't do that. Um, use, the, use the phone to call whoever it is that, that you're your primary care professional that you see. And all this advice comes from, again, the health department website sort of says that if you're sick, stay home, call your uh, physician, nurse practitioner, primary care professional um, on the phone and get some guidance there. The vast majority of people who have this infection actually can stay home and, and take care of themselves at home. And, but then again, if people are severely short of breath or, the, or they feel like it's an emergency, then they're going to call but seek emergency medical care. And again, some, some usual judgment about if you were very sick with the flu, kind of how you would manage your symptoms. But the idea is to not just go to your doctor's office or the emergency room whenever possible to use the phone first. So here we are as a mix. This is the reminders of, of you know, and, and this is hard to do if somebody in your household is sick, but you do your best to sort of have that person be in one room and you're, you're cleaning off the surfaces and you're being very, very careful. Um, covering your cough with a, with a tissue, try not to touch your, your face. That's really hard to do. Wash your hands off and, and keep things clean. Um, and all this is advice from the CDC and our, and our own health department. So, so let's, 
Yeah, and we have a lot of questions, Jan. Um, maybe let's just pause for a second because I know um, we're getting a few questions surrounding some of the information that you're sharing before we um, go a little bit more into the science of social distancing. Um, so question here, some folks are asking, and I think it kind of comes back to while we're saying use common sense, I feel like sometimes we don't quite know um, what level of common sense makes sense at this point, if you know what I mean, because folks are asking, um, you know, should I not see my grandparents even if I have no symptoms or no reason to think that I was exposed to everyone? Um, should I avoid even going into a community center um, like the Davis Center on campus um, if I know that it's, um, you know, there's not a lot of people there? So I think people are just looking for beyond common sense. How do they navigate this? Well, you know, we're kind of saying don't take public, don't get on a bus right now. So that kind of thing. If you were in the Davis Center and there's a whole lot of people there, eh, maybe maybe later. Um, visiting your parents, th those are hard and you have to use some personal judgment here. And some of what um, people who are much older, um, certainly over 60, people of chronic conditions would be at higher risk. So let's say you and their grandchild just has a little runny nose, might be better to stay home, right? Mm -hmm. And And you know, we can't, Everybody has to sort of do the best that they can. But again, we're sort of talking about a wave instead of hugs if we're not sure, um, not cutting off. We're social beings. We can't cut off all contact. And But using the phone, making daily phone calls, using uh, we have Skype and, and Zoom and, and all that. But I would say that, you know, if you think about people that you may not be seeing as often, um, think about talking to them on the phone. I really think it's reassuring to hear someone's voice. You can tell if they're worried, if they're upset, if they're stressed, if they're just lonely. And so maybe in addition to thinking about these visits, which we're not saying don't do any of, but just think about calling more often and, and talking to people. Yeah, and I've heard that advice coming a lot, and it and it feels um, good to think about that. And I'm sure people receiving those con those phone calls um, are very thankful for that. Um, I see a lot more questions coming in, and I believe Jan, Dr. Carney is going to get to quite a bit of that information because uh, people are asking, well, how long might this go on? And 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 I don't think we we quite know the answer to that yet. But going back to uh, the data and the science behind social distancing can certainly at least explain a little bit as to the results of um, the communities that did this uh, so that we understand why we're trying to do this right now. Do you want to talk about a little bit more of the the guidelines and the science behind this study in 2017? Let me talk about this. this you may hear this, what's called flattening the curve. And what does that mean and where did it come from? It actually came from the CDC and they, they published this in their morbidity mortality weekly report. And there again, they call it community mitigation. And you, you hear both of those terms I mentioned. And this to prevent pandemic influenza. And they updated this in, in 2017 after we had the H1N1 virus uh, in 2009 that was widespread. And they updated that. So this is where this came from originally. You may see it in, in uh, different, uh, the press and news articles and things, but this is uh, the source of it. So let, let's look at some more of that. Okay, here is the curve, and this is the goals of community mitigation. So you can see on the vertical axis on the left that you have the number of cases. And then on the horizontal axis, you see the number of days since the first case. So that's just time. And then you can see that a pandemic in that dark purple is if you do nothing, what happens? So everybody is sort of, you know, they're traveling, they're going to restaurants, you're doing all this stuff, nobody's covering their cough and sneeze and on and on and on. You get this big peak of illness, right? What I want you to imagine is where that other sort of hashtag, that lower curve is, a dotted line straight across the chart. And imagine that is sort of the capacity of our healthcare system. So the goal is to really slow this down through the different kinds of social uh, distancing and mitigation that I've been talking about. 
Okay, we're zipping back over to it. Sorry about that, Jan. Not sure what happened there. Um, there we go. Thank okay. you. So we're going to show you specifically what that means. But the goal is to buy ourselves time. If we can reduce the spread through some of these social distancing things that we're talking about, staying six feet away from people, um, kids not going to school. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody gets together someplace else. We really mean to, to have a distance from people. Uh, we are being careful with people who are vulnerable populations, and that might be older people in our family, certainly people who are ill in the hospital or in assisted living or long-term care facility. So the idea is if you put these into place, you reduce the overall number of cases of illness and their associated health effects. And what you do is you allow the healthcare system time to keep up. There's less disease and illness. In this case, we're buying time on a global scale as people are working very, very hard to develop clinical trials with new broad spectrum antiviral medications that would be effective and a vaccine. But that takes time. So we need to all, and one of my messages is we need to, each one of us needs to do our part to protect ourselves. And in doing that, we protect everybody else too, which is a really good thing. Great. So this would be just my, my I think my last example from the scientific literature uh, that's current. This is a more current example, came out March 13th. And it talked about what they did surveillance, that's sort of the disease detectives, disease tracking that epidemiologists do, and containment measures for the first 100 patients in Singapore. And I just use this as an example. I'm not going to go into this in detail. But a more recent example of what we're already learning, and we're learning from China's experience and Singapore of what happened, what they did was they put in these social community, personal and community social distancing measures. They isolated or quarantined people who were ill, like we're talking about here today. If you are ill, you stay home away from people. Um, they also were able to figure out a little bit more from some of the testing that they did. We will be getting to that in our country. So our priority at this time is to implement the proven effective social distancing measures to flatten that curve. Yeah. And I know lots of people probably ask you this throughout the day, and we've had this question several times um, from folks in our chat box today. Um, how long w w will social distancing go on? based on the evidence that you've seen of previous um, instances of implementing social distancing? Let me, let, me tell you what, let me tell you at this point what I think we know and what we don't know. We know that COVID-19 is called novel coronavirus. So it's a new virus. It's an emerging virus. It's one we haven't seen and our immune systems haven't seen. So it's new. We also know that we have proven effective strategies that can contain pandemics. We've learned that from 100 years ago. And we have new evidence from our, right now from the situation with COVID-19 in China that, that the same kind of contain, can, containment and social distancing measures continue to work. So we know that. The, the comparisons, however, between influenza and COVID-19 have to stop there because they're different viruses. And we don't know yet, I don't know of anybody who can predict how long this is going to go on. So we say that we're doing this for the short term, right? And then we know that our public health system, whether that's here in Vermont or in the CDC, is measuring how this is going in the United States. People are also watching China very carefully because we know that their peak has passed and what might happen or not as they kind of relax some of those social distancing measures that they've implemented in their population. So we're learning. Influenza, typically seasonal influenza, maybe tails off in the spring. We don't know whether this will happen with COVID-19 or not. So do we have to be, how can we deal with that? I think we have to be confident that we know the science, if we all do it, it will help protect us individually, protect us as communities, entire states, and our nation. And we have to understand that these things do work.
but we also have to be comfortable and patient that we don't know exactly yet for how long we're going to have to keep doing them. Right, and change some of our behaviors. Um, I know this is a hard question to answer, but wondering what will be the things that will signal that we can start to loosen some of these restrictions and the, the mitigation that we're doing. A, a slowdown of cases being confirmed is probably one obvious thing, but what, from the public health perspective, what will give us the signal that we are coming out of this potentially? I think we'll look, I mean, I, I personally will watch what's happening at the CDC. And when we showed you that map that was going on, and we they follow that and you see in the, and they're tracking this across the country and in every state and see what is the pattern? Have we, have we hit our peak here in the United States? Are different states having a different timing? You know, different states are doing similar things, but a little different, differently. And I think that we'll, we'll have to wait and follow that very carefully. Do you, we have a question too about is Vermont doing enough testing um, and how do we know that the Vermont numbers are accurate? The, the testing has been across the country, in our country, limited. So testing is currently at the um, guidance of the health department and individual healthcare professionals. And it is for people generally who are ill and that there may be some others, but that's been the highest priority. Um, and I think that you can, you can have confidence in the accuracy of the testing, but I think that most, most experts would say that we have a limited number of testing done. It's likely because we saw the numbers of how many people are being monitored, that certainly we could expect to see more people diagnosed with this um, in future days. So let's, we've been talking about social distancing quite a bit um, and the science behind um, why we are being asked to do this and follow this. Um, maybe just go back, um, and we've talked a little bit about, you know, if you can go in and go get milk at the store and what does that look like in visiting parents and grandparents um, or play dates in the park. You know, I think a lot of parents are struggling with trying to understand where is that distance um, and comfort level for their children and their families. Um, walk us through some of these recommendations, and this is also coming from UVM and from the University of Vermont Medical Center as well. This is this is from UVM, but this is on the CDC, and this is from the CDC on the C CDC website. Just what does this look like, and what's the rationale for that? And it has to do if someone didn't cover their cough or sneeze, you know, staying away from people. We're asking people to, you know, if you are ill, stay at home, and that you want to stay a safe distance and really away from people who are coughing and sneezing. But that's kind of a, and, and why are we saying these kinds of things? Let me just go back to another thing that we don't know. And when you don't know, you can go ahead and take protective action and it, then it doesn't matter. So one of the things that's under, currently under study is how long and how infectious people are in the time before they actually get all the fever and the coughing, for example. And the short answer is we don't 100% know. So if you think about what does that mean, well, what if someone's getting sick and they could be spreading it to others, but they look perfectly fine and they feel perfectly fine and they're in the grocery store. So if you kind of are conscious about where you're standing or next to people or not, or just a little bit farther away to make this as part of our sort of our social connections are still there, but just from a little bit greater distance, just be a little conscious of that. Because it's another thing, if everybody does it, it's consistently applied, it will, it will protect us. I mentioned avoiding public transportation, large gatherings, crowded spaces, limiting social plans. Maybe postpone that dinner at your house with a lot of people, just for the short term. You know, how worried should we be? Um, that's a that's a tough call. It's also an individual call. But I say that error on the side of caution. Now, do you want to have all the kids who are home from school over at your house? Probably not. Not right now. Right. And and to think about those play days, well, that's a tough one. You know, playing outside, well, that's probably a good thing, right? And and think about the kinds of activities. And again, I'd reinforce, think about other ways where we can stay close without being right next to people, like talking on the phone.
and right. and hearing people's voices and not losing we're all social beings we need that social connection um i talk to my family all of them multiple times every day and i need to hear their voice and they need to hear my voice and that's a good thing yeah thank you for sharing that with us as well i think we're all feeling finding different ways to reconnect with each other too and and also just really finding creative ways as well and our um, educators um, our faculty here at uvm have just dived right into remote learning and embraced it and are really excited to be able to share this uh, different way um, to learn with our students um, but they're really engaged and really excited to continue that learning opportunity with our students um, and then also you know our k-12 through educators are trying their best to figure out this kind of remote instruction as well um, i helped my son who's 10 set up his uh, piano instructions his piano lesson yesterday via zoom so i think we're all trying to figure this out a little bit and i think it helps when we are connecting and sharing different ideas um, and picking up that phone as well. Um, I think this is another slide that also comes from UVM Medical Center as well. Do you want to just maybe remind folks about the information here? This is the kind of thing, you know, where, again, I mentioned it earlier, but just, you know, if you're sick, you stay home. And if you can, unless it's an emergency, contact your, your primary care provider's office by phone. And that's what everyone is trying to get that message across. And the reason for that is if you do have COVID-19, you're not in the waiting room with all these other people who don't, or you're not in the emergency room or the hospital where there's a lot of people with a lot of risk factors. So it's, it's again, something that we're trying to encourage everyone to do. Um, we definitely have a lot of questions coming in as well, and we'll try to get to those. And thank you, Dr. Hart and Kelly, for also jumping in and answering them. Um, it is very likely we will not to get to all the questions today, um, but but we're happy to, um, Kelly can put up our email address as well, and, and we'd be happy to follow up on some specific topics, but we'll also put up at the end all of the sources that Dr. Carney has been talking about, um, because it's very likely that that information is listed on one of those websites as well. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, the, the new norm uh, for right now in workplaces and remote learning for our students here at UVM as well. Um, and I think it's really great to think about just doing things a little bit differently when you see someone. Um, it's not that we are avoiding that kind of um, connection with people and saying hello. I think we need that right now, but just uh, thinking about doing it a little bit differently. And that's really what this slide is communicating. Is that right, Dr. Carney? That's right. That's from the World Health Organization. So every figure out your own personal style um, for the short term here. Right. And then this are uh, you being a head. faculty and a professor here, Dr. Carney. This is uh, yeah, your yeah. our takeaways for today. We're all teaching online uh, every chance we get. But the science of social distancing is compelling. People ask me all the time, is there really evidence that closing schools and limiting public gatherings works. Yes, absolutely, yes, very powerful. And what we do to protect ourselves will prevent us from getting sick in many cases, but the big thing is it also protects other people from getting sick. And I think that that is, that's huge. It's really, really good. So if we do all these different things for ourselves and our family, and our friends, every day, we're also gonna protect a lot of other people and keep them from getting sick. And that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. And if we all do this, the principles of public health is everybody must be all in. Everybody has to, to think about, you know, take it seriously. We want people to take it seriously, not panic. Do what you're supposed to do in the short term while we're trying to see where things are going and how fast they're getting better. But if we all do this together, we can flatten that curve. There'd be less illness in our community, less strain on our healthcare system, and better outcomes in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and we're in no means trying to diminish, you know, how people are feeling and anxiety and concern that people have, but. I think it, it, this poster um, also comes from the Department of Health, and it's just thinking of reminding us to take a deep breath, 
um, we'll make it through this um, and wash your hands and just go back to some of those real preventative measures that Dr. Carney um, has shared with us. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this in particular? The keep calm, that's what, you know, someone says keep calm and everyone's saying, well, how do I do that? Well, the, fir the first thing it is, just take a pause. Our brains, our brains are wired to, we, we react. And sometimes when you get all this information too fast, we just react. And so how do we do that? Pause, think, remember what are the things we're supposed to be doing and try to do them. One of the things I would mention is the information overload, if I could, um, that there's just too much out there. And I suggest to people, in addition to, to looking at the places that do have the highest quality, evidence-based, scientific information, don't watch all the news feeds 24 hours a day. Sort of pick your times, but as a constant source of everything's changing very fast, um, it's it's a bit too much for people. So give yourself give yourself a break from some of that, and so that you can develop strategies for yourself and your family and your household to uh, protect yourselves. So these are the this is the evidence based information. The CDC, as I mentioned, the health department, the World Health Organization has some great information. It also has the myth busters, which are which are really good and kind of fun. So you might like those. The, um, the New England Journal of Medicine, reputed, famous medical journal, has a great summary of the most current scientific articles. And I thought there were a couple of recent articles from the New York Times that I thought were really good. And they link back to some of the scientific studies and, and these sources, the flattening the coronavirus curve and the wondering about social distancing, because everyone's Everyone's struggling with this. It's hard, but my message again is if we're all able to do it, it will make a huge difference. And we also wanted to share, um, there's a lot of information on the University of Vermont's website as well. Um, and so if you are still having questions related to um, remote instruction, uh, contacting somebody, there's a variety of questions. They've been collecting um, a frequently asked questions page and those probably change daily as more questions come up because we are also trying to evolve and, and take in um, as many questions and find the answers. We don't always know the answers right away, um, but I know the communications team at the University of Vermont is working diligently to try to keep everyone informed, and this is very much on the top of everyone's mind and the concern and well-being of all of our students and our faculty and our staff here at the University of Vermont. Um, and also, the University of Vermont Medical Center has uh, a page as well. Um, and so those are two other sources. If you have specific questions about University of Vermont, um, also the Medical Center has some good information too. And so, also back to Jan's um, point, pick up the phone and call. You know, I think that folks, um, would love to actually be able to answer um, some questions uh, over the phone as well and have that connection with folks also. Um, Jan, we do have a few questions coming in. And again, I, I apologize, we're not gonna get through all the questions today, but thank you, Dr. Hart and Kelly for answering many of them for us. Um, we've had this question quite a bit, but um, what are the differences really between the symptoms of common cold flu versus um, the coronavirus? They can actually overlap. So I guess I would be very reluctant to say, if you have these symptoms, it's just a cold and it's not gonna be anything else, or this, it's it's COVID-19. Because the, the, the like in this way, sort of um, there's general symptoms, like when people have the flu, they might get a fever and achy, and then they might have a cough. In this case, some of the symptoms are nonspecific. So I think that we have to have a very low threshold for what we define for ourselves as being sick. If you have a fever and just a runny nose, I'm not gonna tell you that's just, just a cold. I think you should stay home, isolate yourself. If you need to, call your physician or nurse practitioner or, or whoever it is you're seeing for primary care. Here's another good question as you've been talking about um, thinking of some of your daily routine or um, taking the bus or not taking the bus. Do you, we have a question here um, from Tori, I believe, that says, do you foresee transit being restricted within the United States? Um, 
I can't I can't answer that. I'm following this just like everyone else everyone else is. I think that we are in terms of you know travel and things that we've become more and more cautious about people where people are spending lots of time together. Um, and I, I can't answer any more than that at this time. Um, there's another question, too, that I think has been on the minds of many people. Um, there's lots of reports of people being unable to be tested. Um, I, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but the question, too, is where are the tests made and how about the distribution of the tests so that we can get more out to the communities that need them? Well, well right now, I mean, you know, the, the, if everyone just wanted to be tested, I'm not sure that would help us understand any more about the illness. So I think we have to go back and say, we know the entire United States has had struggled with having adequate testing for healthcare professionals. And I think that those priorities are determined by people calling in when they are sick with the symptoms and determinations, judgments being made with the person who is your physician or nurse practitioner about your illness and do you need to have a test? And at this point in time, I think that's the best use of the testing that we have while everyone is trying to increase that testing. Because on a large scale, as that testing becomes more and more available, there will be more and more studies, you call it surveillance disease tracking, to better understand within households how this is spread. Other things that we really, it ha has happened very, very fast that we're not yet able to do. But just for the, sh for the short term, the tests that we have are being used in excellent priority order through um, health professionals. Thank you, Dr. Carney. We really appreciate your time and your insight and, and bringing um, the perspective of the science of social distancing um, to the community at UVM and at large. We really appreciate that from you and the public health team at the Larner College of Medicine. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hart, also for jumping in and answering questions and our team here at UVM and the Continuing Distance Education Department. Um, Dr. Carney and I have talked a lot about continuing these type of information sessions. Um, and so I'm not sure yet how regular we will be doing them. We'll touch base again and, and talk about the next topic that would be relevant to share with the community. If you have ideas for topics and things that you're really interested in learning about um, for our public health team at the Larner College of Medicine, why don't you send us an email and Kelly can put our email up again. And we'd love to hear from you. What are the things that you're concerned about? What are the things that you're thinking and how we can help to collect that information and present that to you with our experts here at the University of Vermont as well and the College of Medicine. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today, asking questions, um, staying safe, um, considering your um, habits and what you're doing and how you can impact the greater good here and our community. Um, that's really important as we've heard many, many times from Dr. Carney. Um, we'll sign off for now. Uh, thank you again for everyone joining us. This has been recorded. We will post it up on UVM's website and we will share it out to everyone who has joined us today. Dr. Carney, we can't thank you enough for being a voice of calm uh, amongst this. We really appreciate your time today. You're welcome. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again. Have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe and please stay healthy. And we look forward to sharing more information with you in the next coming week or so. Have a great afternoon.